Welcome back to Spectre AI. I'm Spectre P. In this video, we're going to introduce one of the most important advances in quantum secure communication, measurement device independent, QKD, or MDI, QKD. This protocol was designed to fix the single biggest weakness in real quantum systems, the detectors. Today, we'll focus on a high-level overview what MDI, QKD is, why it was invented, and the core idea behind making the measurement device completely untrusted yet still secure. But this is just the beginning. Over the next several videos, we're going to take a deeper dive into all of the critical building blocks that make MDI, QKD possible. Bell state measurements, quantum entanglement, entanglement swapping, the mathematics of state projections, and the full security reasoning behind removing detector trust. Each of those topics deserves its own detailed treatment, and we're going to break them out one by one, with clearer visuals, more rigorous explanations, and much more mathematical detail. This part of the series will feel less like an introduction and more like an advanced course in modern quantum communications. For now, Let's start with the big picture, the motivation for MDI, Q, K, D, the architecture of the protocol, and the core insight that changed the way the field thinks about secure quantum networks. In this diagram, we're looking at the fundamental layout of measurement device independent QKD. The key idea behind MDI QKD is that Alice and Bob no longer send quantum states to each other directly. Instead, they both send their signals into a central measurement node, the box in the middle labeled Bell State Measurement Node. This central node performs a Bell State measurement, but the important point is that this device is considered completely untrusted. It can be owned by Eve, modified by the manufacturer, tampered with, or operating incorrectly. None of that breaks the security of the protocol, the detectors no longer need to be trusted because security comes from the correlations produced by the Bell state measurement itself. On the left side, Alice prepares weak coherent pulses or single photon states in randomly chosen bases. She sends those states forward along a quantum channel, represented by the cyan arrow moving from Alice into the middle measurement node. On the right side, Bob does exactly the same thing. His quantum states travel backward along another quantum channel into the same untrusted node. This is the key architectural shift. Alice and Bob are symmetric senders, and the measurement happens in the middle, not at the receiver's end. Once the Bell state measurement is performed, whether honestly or maliciously, the node generates classical outcomes. Those results are then broadcast publicly over the classical communication channel shown by the dashed gold line. These classical announcements include which detection events occurred, which bell state was measured, and which time slots were successful. Alice and Bob use that publicly announced information, along with their private encoding choices, to identify the rounds where their photons were successfully correlated those correlated rounds form the raw key. After sifting, error correction, and privacy amplification, they end up with a secure shared key, even though the measurement device itself was never trusted. This structure, two quantum channels into a central, untrusted measurement node combined with classical announcements back to Alice and Bob, is the defining feature of MDIQ KD. It removes detector vulnerabilities entirely and creates a protocol that remains secure even if Eve physically controls the measurement device. Now, from this depiction, we can see what actually happens inside Charlie's measurement station during MDIQKD. This entire process is driven by quantum interference, and this image shows you the visual and mathematical structure behind it. Alice and Bob's photons enter Charlie. On the left, we see Alice on the top and Bob on the bottom. Each one sends a single photon toward Charlie, encoded with either a zero phase or a pi phase, 
depending on whether they're sending a logical zero or one. The cyan lines represent their quantum channels. The little cyan circles mark their qubit states arriving at Charlie. In the center is the 50-50 beam splitter. This is the device that mixes Alice's photon and Bob's photon. It doesn't measure them. Instead, it forces their probability amplitudes to interfere. This is one of the core secrets of MDIQKD. Charlie never learns Alice's bit or Bob's bit directly. He only sees the interference between them. The red dashed ellipse marks the interference region. This is where the two incoming photons overlap in space and time, and where their phases either add or subtract. Quantum mechanics doesn't add intensities, it adds amplitudes. And amplitudes are signed, complex numbers. That's why the phase matters so much. At the top right, the two equations show how the beam splitter combines amplitudes. So D0 receives the sum of Alice's and Bob's amplitudes, while D1 receives the difference. Whether the interference is constructive or destructive depends entirely on the relative phase between their photons. After the beam splitter, the outputs are routed to two detectors, D0 on the top and D1 on the bottom. The gold lines represent the classical detection channels. Once a detector clicks, that signal is a classical bit, and it can be safely announced publicly. In the center right, inside the wedge between the beam splitter and the mapping table, we see the label classical bit readout. This emphasizes a key insight. Charlie's detectors produce purely classical information. There's no quantum state left at this point, just click patterns. To the far right, we have the phase to detector mapping. This is the operational rule that determines which detector tends to click for each phase combination. The left side of the table shows the bits Alice and Bob chose, zero or one, encoded as zero phase or pi phase. The right side shows which detector gets constructive interference. Let's take a walk through the table. Row one. Alice 0, Bob 0. When both photons are encoded with the same phase, the amplitudes add constructively at D0. D0 tends to click, while D1 tends to be silent. Row 2. Alice 1, Bob 1. Again, identical phases. Even though both photons pick up a minus sign, the signs match, so interference is still constructive at D0. Row 3. Alice 0, Bob 1. Now the phases oppose each other. The amplitudes subtract. This creates destructive interference at D0 and constructive interference at D1. Row 4. Alice 1. Bob 0. Same situation. Opposite phases. Constructive interference moves to D1. This is a key insight for MDIQKD. So, in summary, if Alice and Bob choose the same bit, D0 tends to click. If they choose different bits, D1 tends to click. Charlie cannot tell what Alice's bit was, and he cannot tell what Bob's bit was, but he can see whether they matched or differed. And that's exactly the only information the protocol needs. Footer. Detection probability. At the bottom right, we remind ourselves of the rule for measurement outcomes. The detection probabilities are proportional to the square of the amplitude magnitude. That's the Born rule. As you can see, this graph is all about quantum interference. Alice and Bob send independently prepared qubits. Charlie mixes them through a beam splitter. Their amplitude phases determine the click pattern, and from that click pattern, we learn only whether Alice and Bob matched, nothing more. This is why Charlie can be completely untrusted. He never gets access to the actual key. This image shows how Charlie's detectors reveal which Bell state Alice and Bob's photons collapse into, and how that depends entirely on the relative phase between their qubit states. If Alice and Bob send photons with the same phase, the amplitudes arriving at Charlie add together. Constructive interference occurs, and the system collapses into the symmetric Bell state, psi plus. 
but if their photons arrive with opposite phase, the amplitudes subtract. This destructive interference collapses the state into the antisymmetric Bell state, psi minus. These two outcomes, addition versus subtraction, are the entire reason Charlie can distinguish same bits from different bits. As you can see in the middle left part of the diagram, in the constructive case, a sub d0 is proportional to a Alice plus a Bob, which produces psi plus. In the destructive case, a sub d1 is proportional to a Alice minus a Bob, which produces psi minus. So Charlie doesn't measure individual bits. He only measures whether the amplitudes combined or canceled. Below that, the visual helped to see the direction of travel. When the states 0, 1 and 1, 0 enter the beam splitter, interference inside the splitter forces the system into one of the two Bell states. If the inputs have the same phase, the interference pushes the output toward psi plus. If the inputs differ in phase by pi, the interference pushes the output toward psi minus. This is how a passive optical device implements Bell state projection. At the bottom left, you see that the symmetric state psi plus is the equal superposition of 0, 1 and 1, 0 states. The anti-symmetric state psi minus is the difference of those same basis states. Only these two Bell states are detectable with linear optics, and that's exactly what MDIQKD relies on. On the right side of the diagram, Charlie maps each Bell state to a detector click. Same phase produces psi plus, which triggers detector D0. Opposite phase produces psi minus, which triggers detector D1. This gives Charlie exactly the information he needs, same bit or different bit, without ever learning the actual value of Alice or Bob's bit. The idea this diagram drives home is that Charlie never gains access to Alice or Bob's secret bits individually. He only learns whether they matched or differed based entirely on which Bell state the interference produces. The probabilities of these outcomes always follow the Born rule. P equals absolute value A squared for each detector. This Bell state projection mechanism is what makes measurement device independent QKD both secure and practical. As we get into specific exploits and defenses, we'll use some math. Let's walk through a complete worked example that shows exactly how the bit values chosen by Alice and Bob determine the relative phase between their photons, how that phase selects a Bell state at Charlie, and how the Bell state dictates which detector clicks. We will look at two cases side by side, when Alice and Bob choose the same bit and when they choose opposite bits. On the left, suppose both Alice and Bob send the bit zero, in this case, they have chosen the same basis and the same bit value, and therefore there is no relative phase shift between their optical modes. Each one contributes an amplitude of 1 over the square root of 2. When these two amplitudes arrive at Charlie's beam splitter, they interfere constructively along the port that leads to detector D0. That's because the amplitudes add 1 over root 2 plus 1 over root 2 gives the square root of 2. Along the port leading to D1, the amplitudes subtract. 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2 gives 0. After normalization, this means the probability at D0 is 1, and the probability at D1 is 0. So in the same bit case, the system always projects into the symmetric Bell state, psi plus, and the click always occurs at detector D0. This is the signature of constructive interference when the bits match. On the right side, consider the opposite bit case where Alice still sends 0, but Bob sends 1. Because Bob's bit is different, his mode carries a pi phase shift relative to Alice's. That shows up as a minus sign in the amplitude. Now, when these amplitudes interfere at the beam splitter, the situation flips. Along the D0 output, the amplitudes cancel. 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2 equals 0. 
Along the D1 output, the amplitudes add 1 over root 2 plus 1 over root 2 equals the square root of 2. After normalization, the probability at D0 is 0, and the probability at D1 is 1. This outcome corresponds to the antisymmetric Bell state, psi minus, and it is the signature of constructive interference at detector D1 when the bits are opposite. Putting both sides together, the pattern is extremely clean. Same bits produce zero relative phase, which produces the symmetric Bell state, which sends all amplitude to D0. Opposite bits introduce a pi phase flip, producing the antisymmetric Bell state, which sends all amplitude to D1. Charlie never learns the actual bits. He only learns whether the bits were the same or different based on which detector fires. But that single piece of information is exactly what Alice and Bob need in order to build their secret key in the entanglement-based version of BB-84. To wrap up this example, here are the main ideas to remember. The only thing that determines Charlie's detector outcome is the relative phase between Alice's and Bob's photons. When the bits match, the phase difference is zero. The amplitudes add, and the system is projected into the symmetric Bell state, psi plus, which roots all the probability to detector D0. When the bits differ, the phase flips by pi, the amplitudes subtract, and the system is projected into the antisymmetric Bell state, psi minus, which roots all the probability to detector D1. Charlie never learns the actual bit values. He only learns whether the bits are the same or different, and this parity information is exactly what Alice and Bob use to build the key. Most importantly, any attempt by an eavesdropper to measure or disturb the photons destroys the interference pattern, scrambling the psi plus and psi minus outcomes. This loss of interference is the fundamental reason BB84 can detect an attacker. Thank you for watching this lesson in the Spectre AI Quantum Security series. If you're enjoying these deep dives into quantum computing, interference, and real-world security, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss the next video. If you want hands-on experience, visit spectreai.ai where we host 55 real-life quantum security labs that let you learn by doing. You can also find our books and extended material on Amazon. Please look at our sample labs on the website and register for free. The books on Amazon take a deep dive into the website labs and include full math and programming solutions. Leave a comment and tell us what topics you want to explore next. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.